Hey guys, we need to understand the thinking that's changing society right before our eyes. So here's what we're going to do. Let's go back to the beginning of the Enlightenment and then we'll look at the Counter-Enlightenment. We'll trace that thinking out to the beginning of the Marxist idea and carry it forward to the defeat of the collectivist right. And that'll take us out to where we're ready to understand our day and the rise of the collectivist left, unfortunately. Now, when we come to The Woke Danger 4, next time we're going to track Antonio Gramsci, the rise of critical theory, the Frankfurt School, and out to postmodernism. We'll be almost be up to, up to where we are going to do the main stuff, but let's keep going. Now, a lot of people in my audience are from the Christian line, and so we look to the, the Reformation, Martin Luther, and that, and there was a lot of things that happened at that time with uh, freeing religion from, from tradition, uh, church authority was smashed in a sense there, and that was really major. However, what we're doing is we're going to track something else that sort of comes from the secular line, even though everything in the secular line sort of tracks back to these God substitutes and becomes secular religion. We'll come to that. But today we're going to look, and we're going to go back and look at the Enlightenment. So the dawn of this period is connected with Francis Bacon, uh, René Descartes, uh, John Locke, and those guys. They left us the legacy of making reason, uh, primary, uh, individualism, uh, science, and the uh, liberalism in the sense of separation of church and state and the representative political process. Those big pieces, which really are at the foundation of our culture today, those come really to us from largely from the Enlightenment. So that's, that's giant. It's difficult to overstate the significance of the Enlightenment. Stephen R.C. Hicks offers us a chart a lot like this one. I'm going to flash on the screen right now from his book, uh, Explaining Postmodernism. And notice the chain of consequence starting on the left side of your screen with the Enlightenment's affirmation of the power of reason leading to progress and happiness over on the right side. And as you look over this uh, graphic real quick, you'll see that a lot of the pieces that, our, that your world is, is based on. It's difficult to overstate the significance of the Enlightenment. Historian Will Durant writes uh, this about it. Science and philosophy became the gods of the Enlightenment. At the height of the French Revolution, a ceremony was held in Paris. 1793 was the year, and in this ceremony it was declared this. Cease to tremble before the powerless thunders of a god whom your fears have created. Henceforth acknowledge no divinity but, fill in the blank, guess it, no divinity but reason. So reason becomes divinity here. We're going to skip the personal God and just go for a thumbs up, all thumbs up on reason. William Lane Craig, a, a leading Christian apologist in our time, and uh, he writes this, Western culture is deeply post-Christian. It is the product of the Enlightenment, which introduced into European culture the leaven of secularism that has by now permeated the whole of Western society. The hallmark of the Enlightenment was free thought, that is, the pursuit of knowledge by means of unfettered human reason alone. Our Enlightenment inheritance, engaged in with respect, and I'm talking about individualism, all these pieces, uh, science, reason, and so on, these are the foundation of contemporary civilization. And all this, the advocates of woke, they're ready to put the torch to it. So let's go back in time now, and a lot of the information we're going to draw from uh, explaining postmodernism, Stephen Hicks here. What we want to do now is look at the counter-enlightenment. And you might, might have said, what? I thought we just, we just learned about the enlightenment. But there was a movement called the counter-enlightenment. In France, Jean-Jacques Rousseau especially opposed its ideas and became the beginning of the, wait for it, the counter-enlightenment. So what did Rousseau do? Well, it would be the opposite of the things we just looked at. Rousseau attacked reason. He said that reason increases wealth and therefore creates an issue that you have to develop property rights. And when you have property rights, and the need for property rights created competition. And competition creates inequality. There it is. And so these things were all looked at as bad things by Rousseau. Reason, he claimed, was against compassion. And so we, we can't go by too much reason. Rousseau wrote that Passions are the proper foundation for society. He said that feelings are a more reliable guide than reason. He said this, I took another guide and I said to myself, let us consult the inner light. Well, good luck with that. But anyways, that's, 
the beginning of the counter-enlightenment is this stuff. Rousseau understood that religion was a very powerful force, and so when he wrote his document, The Social Contract, he actually said this. He opposed state toleration for unbelievers, and here's what he said. If, after having publicly recognized these dogmas, a person acts as if he does not believe them, he should be put to death. That's not quite our American tolerance, is it? Rousseau wanted power to be centralized in the state. He saw the state as the executor of the, of the collective will. Accordingly, he said this, quote, The citizen should render to the state all the services he can as soon as the sovereign demands them. Quote, and, quote, Whoever refuses to obey the general will will be forced to do so by the entire body. This means merely that he will be forced to be free. Unquote. Rousseau's thought was the opposite of that at the beginning of the American idea. Now, the American idea that puts a separation between church and state, that puts a limitation on government powers to protect individual rights of freedom. Rousseau is kind of like everything opposite that. He wants the collective will, you must do what the state says, no big separation. Oh yeah, and if you don't agree, uh, then you should be put to death. Whereas the new American government featured checks and balances to limit the power of the state, Rousseau wanted everything to go over to the state. Now, German thinkers, mostly, mostly Lutheran and Catholic, uh, looked across at this business, and we move to another stage now. They saw the Enlightenment as anti-religious, and so they were very skeptical about it. So besides Rousseau's skepticism, Immanuel Kant made a pretty significant contribution to this whole picture, another, another one that you'll, see, rec you'll recognize it immediately. So here's his big philosophical move. This is what Hicks says. Kant, that great champion of reason, asserted that the most important fact about reason is that it is clueless about reality. Kant marks a fundamental shift from objectivity as the standard to subjectivity as the standard. And it's on, unquote, and it's on this, this giant movement from the objective to the subjective this, this is the wheel upon which everything's going to turn, and we're going to head back now out towards postmodernism, and then finally where we are today, God help us, in applied postmodernism. You know, and this book has over 100 pages discussing the ideas of Rousseau and Kant at length. Uh, many writers list these figures as, you know, greats of the Enlightenment, but really what these people are, are these are the, these are the key, key thinkers of the counter-Enlightenment. Well, we move on now to another fellow here, Georg W.F. Hegel whose name I obviously can't pronounce. Hegel built on Rousseau and Kant. Now let me emphasize Hegel's view about the relationship between the individual and the state. There's many things we might say about Hegel's philosophical connections here. We'll see a big one in just a minute. But notice this when he thinks about the individual and the state, their relationship. Hegel said this, All the worth which the human being possesses, all spiritual reality, he possesses only through the state, unquote. He even said that, one must, quote, one must worship the state as a terrestrial divinity, unquote. And Hicks, Hicks makes this evaluation. He says this, We find in the case of Hegel a call for total government to which the individual will surrender everything, unquote. For Hegel, Hicks says, the collective, not the individual, is the operative unit, unquote. And that's where we are seeing today. Groups, collectives, this is what's coming to the front it's, it's the group you're connected to, not the individual at all. So here's some giant philosophical pieces that are building a foundation, uh, a tragic foundation actually, to move us toward uh, applied postmodernism. But we can't stop with Hegel, we've got to keep moving, and so we come to the idea, and there's a, a person you've heard of named Karl Marx. Marx was very heavily influenced by Hegel, we don't have time to plow into that all here, but suffice it to say, you can look that up. If you want to go back behind Marx, and some, of us, some people are tracing woke back to Marx, but if we're going to take it back uh, further and see what influenced Marx, we, we go directly to Hegel and back on further where we've just come. So Marx taught that private businessmen, they own the means of production and that the workers are being oppressed by these uh, businesses, by these businessmen, and what the workers need to do is they need to figure out that they're being oppressed, and then they need to rise up and revolt against them and, and seize the means of production from the rich guys, and then they need to take it over, and uh, we get into this wonderful over-the-rainbow uh, utopia where everybody's equal and there aren't any rich people. 
So the important thing is to have this, this uh, class consciousness that the workers figure out that they are uh, needing to basically overthrow the rich folks. And when we get there, we get to utopia. So Marx said this, see if you hear of the flavor we were just talking about in the previous philosophers. Here's what Marx says, quote, Marx said that society does not consist of individuals, but expresses the sum of interrelations, the relations within which these individuals stand, unquote. So Marxism insists that capitalism is going to collapse based on its own internal inconsistencies. Another thing that's interesting is that Marxism is extremely hostile to religion. In fact, uh, there were many years of torture and tragedy and murder of Christians under Marxism, both, both in the Soviet Union and later in, in communist China. Marxism, uh, in this original part, assumes that economics influences everything, and so it influences religion. Paul Kinger writes this, quote, Marx was an atheist utopian who envisioned a new morality without God. The path to utopia was a classless, albeit godless, society. The classless society, which would be a worker's paradise, would, said Marx, make its own history. It is a leap from slavery into freedom, from darkness into light, unquote. Now, Marx's ideology was implemented in Russia in 1917 in the Bolshevik Revolution. An ardent communist looked for a civil revolution to occur in Germany, at about the same time. In fact, it seems there are some very interesting connections between Germany and Russia. The key point is that they looked for this uh, revolution that occurred in, this, in Russia to also occur in Germany and just didn't occur. But for now, I want to include with a critically important observation by Stephen R. C. Hicks, and he has it here in Understanding Postmodernism. If there's one take-home piece out of this uh, super quick tour, this is it. Listen to this, all right? So Hicks, in his chapter titled The Climate of Collectivism, he, he works on these topics in some depth. I'm just going to read you one paragraph from that. He describes left and right collectivism. Left and right collectivism. Now, you say, well, what is that? Well, for right collectivism, think, think Nazis, okay? That's Germany, the right collectivism. For left collectivism, think basically the American left today, all right? So here's what uh, Hicks says. Here's what he writes. What links the right and the left is a core set of themes. Anti-individualism, the need for strong government, the view that religion is a state matter, whether to promote or to suppress it, the view that education is a process of socialization, ambivalence about science and technology, and strong themes of group conflict, violence, and war. Left and right have often divided bitterly over which themes have priority and over how they should be applied, yet for all their differences, both the collectivist left and the collectivist right have consistently recognized a common enemy, liberal capitalism. With its limited government, its separation of church and state, its fairly constant view that education is not primarily a matter of political socialization, and its persistent Whiggish optimism about prospects for peaceful trade and cooperation between members of all nations and groups, unquote. You might need to play that back and hear it again, but that paragraph is very important insight. Now, we all know World War II led to the destruction of the collectivist right, the Nazis lost. But... When that happened, it sort of opened the way for this big confrontation now between liberal capitalism and the collectivist left. And now, some years down the line, many decades down the line, at the moment, the collectivist left is, is looming into giantness. We face a rapid rise in the power of the collectivist left. Let me warn you, there's nothing to feel comfortable about the rise of the collectivist left. In dangerous respects, the present situation in America is very similar to the situation in Russia in 1916. Remember what happened in 1917? I hope you found this to be useful. We're, go we're drilling back to some stuff that isn't being uh, talked about too many other places. So this will give us added insight in just a little bit when we go out and plow into it the present deal.